This week, I boarded our garage loft, and so in today's video, I'm gonna outline the steps I've taken, the tools I've used, and as usual, the mistakes I've made to transform this space from a mouse-infested, chaotic jumble of rubbish into this. Now, for years, this loft has been a dumping ground of stuff we should have got rid of, and it was with light pouring in during the re-roofing last summer, I realized I needed to make more of this space. A lot of loft videos will start with the need to strengthen the existing joists before you can walk on them, but in my case, the previous owner of this cottage had clearly designed for this space to be used. It was decked out with six by two inch joists, and this massive RSJ steel running the full length of the garage. Now, if you watched my solar panel install video in the summer, you'd have seen that I did board out a little bit of the loft to make way for the inverter and the batteries for the kit. But the need to finish the job has become more urgent now. We're starting building works in the kitchen in a couple of weeks time, so I need some overspill space. My wife's running the marathon, so we need somewhere a bit more inspiring to set up the treadmill. And the boards that I bought for this job have been sat ever since the summer in a massive pile in the middle of the garage floor. Now, as this space will be somewhere for my son to play his drums, as well as doubling up as a gym, I decided it would be good to make it a bit more accessible rather than just having access through a loft ladder. So I went online a couple of weeks ago and ordered a staircase through Stairbox. You can see I've left a few floorboards down there because there'll be a bit of reconfiguring to do to install that. You might just keep an eye out for that video, which should be appearing online in a few weeks time. Before commencing the flooring, I applied Neutra Rust 661 to the gently rusting RSJ, which was installed back in the 1970s. If you haven't seen my video on how I de-rust our 1970s cast iron guttering, with this stuff in the summer, I massively recommend it as it neutralizes the rust and creates a hard, water-soluble, hydrophobic film on the surface. So let's have a look at the things you need to think about when installing flooring. The first thing I had to think about was whether I needed any additional noggins to strengthen those joists. Well, if the span is less than 2.5 meters, I understand noggins aren't required. My span from that central RSJ to the wall plates at the edge is just over 2.6 meters. And as you remember, my joists are a respectable six by two inch or 150 by 50 millimeters. I'd also be adding perimeter noggins along the edge. So I decided with all this taken into account that additional noggins towards the middle would not be necessary. And the finished floor feels rock solid particularly with the extra strengthening that I'll be adding for the access hatch. More on that in a minute. The next question to ask yourself is what sort of flooring should you be putting down? With flooring ranging in quality and also thickness, you need to choose a flooring to match the span of your joists. And of course, what you're gonna be using that space for. We're going to be using this room fairly often and I've got 600 millimeter centers, that, which is the gap between the center of each joist. And when I had a quick chat about this with master carpenter Robin Clevett a few months ago, he suggested I use 22 millimeter P5 chipboard, which is 22 millimeters thick, tongue and grooved all the way around and also moisture resistant. So I went online and found this caber flooring from buildingmaterials.co.uk, the same company I used to source all the MDF and redwood for my wardrobe build that you might have seen. Caber floor is a Norboard product and Norboard have a very good specification sheet that I'll post a link to in the description, which tells you pretty much everything you need to know for your project. They recommend for joists up to 450 mil centers to use 18 millimeter board and for 600 millimeter centers, obviously the board that I've bought. I should point out I did buy my caber floor, although I did receive a discount for mentioning them in the video. I also bought these Spax floorboard screws from Wix. I'm gonna say I'm really pleased with these screws. As you might know, I'm a big fan of Torx Bit TX screws. And they screw in fantastically without the need for a pilot hole, leaving a beautiful flush finish that didn't require countersinking. I suppose I could have used tongue tight screws as I used on my engineered oak floorboarding, but I decided this being a garage, there was no need for the screws to be hidden. And actually these spack screws would provide more downward force onto the floorboards. Now in this section, I'm gonna talk about a few of the big mistakes I made on this job. This is a bit of an obvious point to make, but it's really important to plan the placement of your floorboards before you start putting them down. Sounds obvious, but I didn't do that in my rush to get the flooring down for the solar inverter and battery install. So you need to measure the width of each sheet and the total span they're covering to work out where to start. Now, not only did I not do this, I also pushed my sheets of floorboarding right up against the rafters, meaning there was no expansion gap. And you're meant to leave a 10 millimeter gap for expansion of the floorboarding all the way around. 
So the first job I had to do the other day was chisel away a 10 millimeter gap where those floorboards were butting up against the rafters. Had I planned this better, I could have equalized the gap at both sides of the room. But instead, I've got no gap on the original side where I started, apart from that 10 mil expansion gap and too wide a gap where I end, which is gonna mean I either have to put in a fiddly little strip incorporating a tongue and groove, which will be a lot of wastage, or I have to just make do with the gap I've got and move those noggins that I've put in further back to support the end of the board. More on those noggins in a minute. The second big mistake I made was putting the floorboards the wrong way up. Now this sounds particularly stupid when you look closely at that printing on the boards that says this side up. But the reason I didn't do that is because we're going to be using this as some sort of a games roomy type space. I don't know whether I'm going to carpet or paint it anytime soon, although I have varnished it, more on that in a minute. And I didn't want all of that text streaking across the floor. But there's a very good reason why they tell you to put it, the flooring with the text that way up, although I wish they actually put the text on the underneath. There is a good and a bad side to these floorboards, as you can see here. The underside has these blemishes and it also has a mottled appearance when compared with the other side. Now the next point is perhaps a bit more important than that and has really left me thinking, you stupid idiot, putting the boards the wrong way up. These boards have been designed with an asymmetric tongue and groove. The point being that they're designed for the load to be exerted from above. And I think the specification I phoned Norboard this morning is two kilonewtons of pressure. Now, if you've done what I've done, I don't know what that decreases the load bearing ability to. And I, and I guess because I've glued the tongue grooves together with the Egger flooring adhesive, more on that in a minute, it might sort of reduce the impact of this, but it's a point to make. Don't put your floorboards the way up I have. And the final point is, I suspect with the floorboards the right way up, had I decided to use tongue tight hidden screws, the floorboarding is better set up with the text on the top for you to screw through the tongue and groove. Clearly, if I had my time again, I would have put the floorboards the right way up, even with all that writing cluttering the floor. The third point is staggering. Almost as soon as I'd posted that video in the summer, people pointed out to me that I should have staggered those floorboards. Tongue and groove chipboard flooring should be laid in a staggered formation to spread the weight distribution across the joist below. With the long edge running across the joist and the shorter edge finishing at the centre of the joist. Now I couldn't move those boards I installed in the summer because they're all glued together. So in order to stagger the remaining boards going forward, I started cutting half sheets, making sure that these ended on a joist. Now this was fine for this board because the cut piece could go against the wall, giving me a nice tongue and groove joint on the joist. But my joists aren't spaced at exactly 600mm centres, meaning the other end of each sheet invariably missed the joist. You could in this situation cut each sheet back to the nearest joist. Oops, that wasn't meant to happen, meaning you support the two cut edges directly above the joist, as in fact I had to do to get the staggering started on these boards I hadn't staggered to begin with. But this would lead to a lot of wastage. I've got enough as it is. So the obvious thing to do is not to cut the sheet back, but to strengthen that tongue and groove end joint that's unsupported with three noggins in the shape of an H. And yes, you even have to do this with 22 millimeter thick sheets. And this was another little bit of advice that Robin gave me a few months ago. Here's an H section that I've done just to demonstrate this point. And where my sheets ended just before the joist, I've glued and screwed a noggin like this to the joist instead. Not pretty I know, but what can you do when your joist centers aren't consistent? Now it's a good idea to add perimeter noggins too, both to strengthen the joist, but also to add a bit of support to that long unsupported edge of flooring. So I set about adding noggins as I was laying the floorboards. But after the issue I mentioned earlier with starting the flooring too close to the rafters on the other side of the room, I'm gonna to have to either move the noggins or waste a few of the remaining sheets, cutting off the tongue and groove long edge so I can fill this gap. Now you've probably seen I used my Ryobi HP circular saw that was gifted to me several months ago to cut these sheets of flooring. I was really interested in this circular saw because it's one of the few circular saws out there that's a bit of a hybrid in the sense that it combines the use of a track, which is normally the preserve of plunge saws. But what really disappoints me with this plunge saw is that this plastic saw rail track, which sort of bolts together like a sort of glorified piece of scale electrics, is almost impossible to get hold of here in the UK. 
This one's on eBay and it comes from Italy. So I'm really disappointed that Ryby didn't make this circular saw compatible with a standard aluminium track as you would use on plunge saws. Like for example, DeWalt have done with this one. Oh, it's getting a bit chilly now, I need to insulate this next. Should we talk glue? Now you're meant to glue the floorboarding down to the joists as well as the tongue and grooving. I decided not to glue it down to the joist because uh, I just don't know what we're quite going to do with this space in the future. Uh, we're thinking we might try and get permission to convert this space at some point for my son to live in who's got special needs. So for the time being at least I decided to use this agar joint adhesive on the joints alone and rely on the considerable bite of those back screws to stop the floor from creaking or otherwise moving on the joists. And I used a combination of brute force with a bit of wooden hammer and these Irwin clamps pushing against a bit of wood screw to the joists to force each sheet of cable floor tightly together. Now just a couple more things to deal with for the end and one of them is this access hatch. I will be putting in a staircase as I've discussed but my carpenter mate John suggested that we put in an access hatch to lift the big things up here in a way that doesn't damage the staircase. Now initially this concerned me a bit as my roof constructed by the previous owners back in the 1970s has no purlins, struts or props and only a very small ridge collar at the top. It drives all its uh, support as, as far as I'm concerned at least from the strength of those 6x2 rafters and the rafters being bolted to each joist which itself runs the full width of the room. I was concerned that cutting the joists in two might break this structure but I consoled myself with the fact that I'd be over engineering the loft hatch and the cut joists would also be supported or kept in place by the floorboards. And the rafters may also have been fixed down onto the wall plate which I haven't really looked closely for. Anyway here's what I did. I strengthened the two joists either side of the one I was cutting out by gluing and screwing an additional 6x2 joists to each of them. I also bought these bolts but screw and glue I reckon will be sufficient. Let me know in the comments if you disagree. I originally planned to cut out two joists but given my worry about compromising the integrity of the roof structure I decided to remove just one. But the glue had set by the time I decided it wasn't necessary so I'm going to have to leave it in place. A temporary brace screwed from above is meant to support the timbers being cut but in my case these joists were already supported by the floorboards. And then slightly annoyingly I realised the newly glued down floorboard was on top of where I needed to cut the joist so I had to cut it instead from below which went surprisingly well helped by using a brand new jack saw. The second cut was straightforward but I stupidly forgot to film this. I then double up the end timbers screwing and gluing the first directly into the joist side cut and gluing and screwing the second end timber into the first. Each end timber was then screwed securely to the doubled up joists. I then added joist hangers to both the end timbers and doubled up joists and I decided to cut them down as bending the hanger over the top of the joist would have clashed with the floorboards. And I used these galvanised twist nails to securely nail the hangers into position. I then cut in half an old gravel board again with my circular saw and used this to create an internal frame inside the opening for the new hatch to sit on. I then constructed a new loft hatch out of the 6x2 timber and screwed the other half of the gravel board to this. It was a bit of inevitable fine tuning as I made it a bit too tight to lift in and out easily but I now have an extremely strong but very heavy hatch that can be dropped into position. I thought about how to lift the hatch in and out. I could drill four finger holes or put these brass flush rings in but at £10 a pop I don't really fancy spending £40 on this. It'd be great to hear what you do in the comments section below. Maybe I'll just leave it as something I have to push up from below. I've left a few boards here as we're going to have to cut through more joists to install the staircase. I would just say again it's an obvious point but don't be tempted to do what I did here and board from both sides of the room as you can end up with a gap if you're not careful when the two sides meet in the middle. Quite apart from the issue of fitting the tongue and grooving together. I bought a two and a half litre tin of varnish this morning. It's not really enough. So I'm really trying to make this go as far as possible. I may still run out but we shall see. But luckily I just had enough with a tiny bit to spare for the floorboards that will be going around the staircase opening and it's dried to a pretty respectable colour and finish. Two more things to talk about. Firstly lighting. Most of the boarding works were powered by my 18 volt sight lamp 
which casts a fantastic light and has been great for all manner of jobs over the years. But now the room was finished, I needed some decent lighting. Dalton, an electrician on my Discord forum, which you can sign up to by becoming a Patreon, recommended these LED panels. I bought five for 204 quid, which I think was a pretty decent price. The mounting brackets were extra, so I decided to make my own, making a frame from all recycled roof battens taken off the roof this summer and routed out for the panels to be inlaid into. I lined them up with my DeWalt laser level and screwed the panels to the ridge beam. I could then release a couple of the screws in the frame and slide the LED panel in single-handedly and then screw the frame back up to the ridge beam. As you can see, they cast a fantastic light across the room. And so we're on to the final part of today's vid, what I'm calling the mighty hoist. My carpenter mate John had suggested I construct the access hatch and it was time to put it to the test. With our secondhand treadmill a whopping 97 kilograms and the punch bag base with at least two 20 kilogram sacks of sand inside it, I reckon about 50 kilograms in weight, not to mention a sofa, we needed something special to lift this lot up into the loft. So I bought this 1000 kilogram Hilker chain block from Toolstation through the WeShop app where you get shares for each purchase. I'll post details of how you can sign up to that in the description. I didn't want to risk putting all that weight on the rafters so I decided I needed to construct some kind of self-supporting gantry and so I set about creating one from 3 by 2 timber slightly making it up as I went. And it's ended up being incredibly strong, being braced in three places here, here, and also here. First up was a punch bag, which was an absolute doddle to winch up. Then came the treadmill, which initially I couldn't get high enough, but by raising the hook and lowering the fixing point on the treadmill, I cracked it and was able to winch it up, drop it down on the loft floor, and then move the gantry over until it was totally sat inside the loft. Gantry Mark II will have wheels. So that's it for today. I hope you found this video useful in spite of all the mistakes, but I guess at least with those mistakes, I'm pointing out errors to you in the hope that you won't make them yourself. As usual, everything I've referred to today will be in the description below the video, which you can access on your smartphone by clicking here and on your PC by clicking the show more button. Depending on when the builders arrive next week, I'll either be showing the build of that staircase or possibly a bit of log splitting, so stay tuned for that. And finally, as I always say, if you're new to my channel, it would mean so much to me to have you subscribe. You can do that by clicking on the link here and don't forget to click the bell notification icon so you get notified of all my future uploads. Thanks for watching and I'll see you soon.